Welcome to Modleek. My name is Jeffrey Stern, and at Modleek we light a spark or shed some light on a Jewish text or tradition. Along with Rabbi Adam Mintz, we host Modleek Disruptive Torah on Clubhouse every Thursday and share it as the Modleek podcast on your favorite platform. Today, it is Tisha B'Av, and we don't listen to music. In this past week, Israel has been subjected to nationwide protests, potentially catastrophic strikes, deep division, and a total lack of political leadership, culminating in a rash move by the Knesset. We've seen this movie before, so we mourn, we learn, and maybe we discover a glimmer of hope. Join us for Tisha B'Av came early this year. Well, you don't say welcome on uh, on Tisha B'Av, Rabbi, do you? You don't say shalom. You do not, but but we're but it's a, this is the day to discuss all these things that you that you've brought up. So, so the first thing that we're going to do is a little housekeeping. We are going to uh, give the rules of what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and um, it's not only Tisha B'Av, but it's also the, the three-week period before Tisha B'Av. And that has become part of the discussion as well. Um, David Friedman, of all people, the ambassador um, uh, to Israel under um, President Trump, I believe he's a rabbi, um, um, he's been very very supportive of Bibi. This is a tweet that uh, he, he, he gave. He says, given the striking parallels between Israel's current internal rift and the infighting that caused the destruction of the Second Temple 2,000 years ago, why would the Israeli government proceed with its judicial reform bill on the eve of Tisha B'Av? Very bad timing, he writes. Um, it gets, it gets more complicated. Uh, Menachem Butler writes, Remember that the disengagement from Gaza was carried out the day after Tisha B'Av in 2005. In 2005, uh, Prime Minister uh, Sharon disengaged from um, uh, uh, Gaza, um, Gush Katif. It uh, is really, it plays a role in what's going on today. But fascinatingly enough, a secular Jew had the brains to do it the day after Tisha B'Av. I don't know if it is urban legend, but one of the arguments that Christopher Columbus was Jewish was that he sailed, he delayed the sail to uh, the new land um, until the day after Tisha B'Av. That would be a traditional approach. The fact that this all went on during the week before Tisha B'Av, it is quite amazing, isn't it, Rabbi? It is quite amazing. The fact, right, that is amazing. And and what Butler pointed out is the fact that this took place the uh, week before Tisha B'Av and that took place on Tisha B'Av. It just seems that everything is taking place on Tisha B'Av. I mean, it can't just be by chance, right? Well, you know, in this case, when you say it can't be by chance, usually we say that with the eye, eye pointing upward to the Kodesh Baruch who is saying he must be manipulating things. But I don't think we have no, the luxury. No, I don't say it that way. I, I, I say it just that, you know, it's like, it's like, wow, right? It's kind of like a wow moment. We don't have to say it in a religious way. We can say it just in a straight way. You're right. right you're right. It's it, it, the current cur- cur- Clearly, nothing uh, was done without some thought. It's not like, oops, it was a mistake. I scheduled the party on the wrong day. Um, I'm just right. going to read a few more tweets. They're all in the source sheet. The source sheet is posted. Um, we're going to get into town rabbis discussing how 2,000 years ago to deal with crisis. One of the tweeters says, I think we can rely on the Talmudi Chachamim in the government and their advisors. To be rest assured, it's obviously very important they get this done, or they wouldn't be doing it at this time. So that that tweeter almost turns it on its head. And I will uh, finish with uh, the last tweet. And this is from uh, Kim Khoury. He says, I've been saying the exact same thing to my family in Israel. It's forbidden to sign contracts, make big decisions three weeks before Tisha B'Av. The religious in the coalition who are rushing to vote suddenly stricken with amnesia about how bad this is. Can't they wait a few days? So even before we begin our discussion, I, I named the podcast um, uh, Tisha B'Av came early this year. But but clearly, we are living history and we are playing history. We are living um, uh, the laws, the halachot, uh, and we are uh, watching them being mis- 
massaged and bent before our eyes? You know, do you do this dafka before Tisha B'Av? Um, um, it, it's, it's just, it brings up all of the issues that we actually should be discussing today, but unfortunately it's not an intellectual discussion. It's a, it's a real discussion of why couldn't this be delayed was one of the main issues. Why couldn't this be discussed with panels, with experts? Why did it have to be rushed? And that, too, was something that comes up in the actual story of Tisha B'Av. So it's really deja vu all over again, is it not? Yes, it really is. I think that's the important point to talk about. So we're not allowed to study Torah today, but we are allowed to study texts that relate to uh, the destruction. So I think normally I've always thought that uh, and said that the reason the temple was destroyed was because of Sinat Chinam, which I think would be um, um, hatred that had no merit. It was needless, needless hatred. And it all comes down to a story of this Kamtsa Baba Kamtsa. We discussed it a few weeks ago when we discussed the position of feasts uh, in, in, in Judaism. And because the early part of the story where he's not invited or he shouldn't be invited, he's embarrassed in front of the rabbis, because it's so appealing, we never get to how the story plays out. So we're going to go right to Gittin 56a, and we're going to forget about the parties and the invitations, and we're going to go to what happened when this Kamsa, who had been so insulted, um, uh, goes uh, to uh, the Caesar, uh, the ruler, and says, if you send a sacrifice uh, to the Jews, they will not sacrifice it in the temple. You will see that they have no regard for you. And what what he does is he takes uh, an animal that is uh, pure without blemish, and then he makes a slight blemish in it that isn't almost a, uh, a visible from the outside. And what he's trying to do is put the rabbis into a compromising uh, position. And so the rabbis look at this uh, animal, and they have this challenge. If they sacrifice it, they're sacrificing an animal that, according to the halacha, should not be be sacrificed. They're breaking the Torah. If they don't, they are proving Kamsa's point, and the um, uh, the ruler, the Caesar, will um, um, take revenge on the Jewish people. So they they talk about it, and um, they uh, decide that if they sacrifice this animal, uh, they say then other th- generations will look at it and say, "Oh, the law must be that you can uh, sacrifice." an animal with a blemish. I mean, here they're having this academic discussion uh, and the future of, um, uh, of, of uh, their, their future is at stake. The word that they use is, it's a question of shalom, shalom malchut, or a question of following the strict reading of the law. And of course, they decide not to sacrifice it. And that triggers Rabbi Yochanan, who says, the excessive humility of Rabbi Zechariah ben Ak Kalas destroyed our temple, burnt our sanctuary, and exiled us from our land. I would say, before I get your comment, Rabbi, that it's really not humility. I would say it's smallness. I would say it's lack lack of vision. And maybe in another discussion, it will uh, impact how we discuss the word anivut in in Jewish uh, texts. But one, do you think I'm right? And and what is your impression here. That's very good. Smallness is a very good term. Means that it it was just, it was was an inability to see the bigger picture. And I think obviously this week we're very, you know, we're, we're very sensitive to that. Means do you look at the small picture or do you look at the big picture? Um, yeah, that's, that's for good. I like that definition. But it's fascinating that it starts, uh, with um, going to the rabbis. And I, I think 
uh, at this uh, stage, um, yes, we are talking about rabbinic leaders and religious leaders, but given the fact that in those days, rabbinic leaders were leaders, um, is that we don't necessarily have to be uh, all shook up and, and say this is a problem necessarily of religious leadership, uh, but more a, a, a problem with leadership in, in those days. Right. I, I think that's 100 percent correct. I'm taking you off would, the hook a little agree. bit on this what right yeah no no that's right so in baba metzia it says that uh they must perform uh beyond the letter of the law as rabbi yochanan says jerusalem was destroyed only for the fact that they adjudicated cases based on the torah by itself they should have um, it talks about the word Meshurat Hadin, which is the letter of the law, and what they should have done is gone Lifnim Meshurat Hadin. Lifnim Meshurat Hadin, I think there are times where um, uh, it can be explained as someone who does the law in a more profound way. I think here it means the spirit of the law. That's correct. That's exactly what it means. That sometimes, you see, this that point is a, a very important point in a lot of different areas. That sometimes you get caught up in the details of the law and you forget what the spirit of the law is. And this is saying that the details are important, but don't ever forget the spirit of the law. So, so, so far, if we want to list our characters, we have an aggrieved party, Kamsa, an individual who is just um, somewhere in his, in his, in his past, um, his nose has been turned in the wrong way. We have rabbinic slash general leadership that also are thinking very small, uh, cannot see the spirit of the law. And then um, in, in, in Gittin 56a, as we move on, um, the Roman authorities then sent Vespasian Caesar against the Jews. He came and laid siege to Jerusalem for three years. And then it takes a little sojourn. It says there were in that time in Jerusalem three wealthy people, Nakdimon ben Gurion. Ben Kalba Savua and Ben Sitzit Hakaset. And these three wealthy people, remember there's a siege going on, offered their assistance. One of them said to the leaders of the city, I will feed the residents with wheat and barley. One said with wine, salt, and oil. And one said to the leaders, I will supply the residents with wood. The sages praised them um, and went on to say that had these three wealthy men between them enough commodities to sustain the siege for 21 years. So now you have, I don't know if it's the, uh, the, the tech community. These are the producers. These are the people that have enough to create a solution to help the um, whole Jewish community survive. Uh, it's amazing as I read this, and, and it goes on much longer than the snippets that I provided. It is really talking about uh, members of the community who were ready to stand up for the siege and were ready to supply enough grain and goods and food so that the siege would have no bearing. I had never really focused on this before. Yeah, I mean, that's good. Now, how do you want to connect that to the modern world? Well, again, I'm looking at the characters, and I don't think we're going to get direct parallels, uh, but certainly in what's happened uh, over the last six months in Israel, we're seeing different sectors. We're seeing rabbis. We're seeing leaders. We are seeing uh, what they call the, the, uh, the business community, the, the tech community. And it just hit me uh, between the eyes as I'm reading this that there was a community, there were players in the, before the siege um, or during the siege who were really to help out. And what happens next is, um, is, is fascinating, because at this point it says there were certain zealots uh, among the people of Jerusalem, and the word in Hebrew it uses birionei, um, 
I looked up the translation in Sfira, uh, and it took and it says it's terrorists. <laughs> these were zealots. These right, were that's correct. Uh, that's so uh, interesting, by, right? by any means necessary. Um, um, and uh, what happened is um, they the sages said to them, "Let us go out and make peace with the Romans." But the zealots did not allow them to do this. The zealots said to the sages, "Let us go out and engage in battle against the Romans." But the sages says to them, "You will not be successful." It would be better for you to wait until the siege is broken. Here's what happens. In order to force the residents of the city to engage in battle, the zealots arose and burnt down these storehouses of wheat and barley, and there was a general famine. So I have recently been reading the Israeli press, and I have been just overwhelmed, astounded about how public it is amongst the, the just the journalists in her, secular newspapers like Haaretz who are referring to those zealots and how they basically blackmailed, how they sabotaged um, the, um, the state of Israel 2,000 years ago to bring it to its feet. And I said to myself, because I had started looking at these texts earlier in the week, and now I said, boy, this is the first time I'm on the same page as everyone else. And then this morning, I turned on Israeli t- TV, and I saw the animated full-feature movie called Legend of the Destruction. It was made by Giddy Dar in 2021. I don't know whether you can see it. It was showing on uh, uh, Khan, the, the TV station today. And it literally, I have screenshots that I took this morning in the source sheet where they literally show exactly what this Talmud is talking about. Uh, they, they say, my God, they're burning down the warehouses. They say, Meturafim, Meturafim. They are crazy. They are crazy. It literally goes in graphic because it is animated in graphic detail how we created the famine that destroyed Jerusalem. And this is something that's being repeated throughout the press in Israel, and I argue that it came from this amazing movie that came out uh, two years ago, and pretty much everyone uh, has seen. Um, So um, uh, it's really amazing that um, the, um, the, the source of the um, uh, destruction of Jerusalem, uh, the fact that they could not stand up to the famine, was self-inflicted. And I think that absolutely comes out very clearly. And I don't think it was necessarily public uh, knowledge. And more importantly, I don't think it comes out when we say Sinat Chinam. You know, Sinat Chinam is, as I said before, um, hatred that is is needless. Um, uh, This is not hatred that is needless. This is um, thought out, uh, planned um, um, uh, destruction and sabotage in order to achieve one's goal by a very, um, um, uh, I guess, leveraged and vibrant uh, uh, minority. Uh, that's, I, I couldn't believe the text this year, how different they looked in my eyes. You should know that Josephus when he talks about the destruction of the temple, he basically says that it was a result of civil war. The reason the temple was destroyed is because the Jews were fighting against each other. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think um, the uh, Talmud is on record um, for also quoting um, Caesar himself, um, who says um, uh, the, the Jews are killing themselves. What What is going on? Um, uh, it, it, it's just, uh, it was obvious to everyone. This was a self-inflicted um, uh, injury and, and death sentence. And I will just want to pick up a second on this sense of sinat chinam. Um, I think this sense of needless, um, it actually, we've talked about this before. The first time it's used is when the spies uh, go out and they come back and they, according to the Bible, they cry all night. 
night, and the Talmud says it was on Tisha B'Av, and that they cried needlessly, uh, Bechi Shel Chinam, and as a result, um, the temple and all these bad things have happened. I think what we are seeing is that people, what's driving a lot of this is our lack of ability to get beyond our own history. Um, um, you, we saw in the Twitter comments how some were saying, yes, uh, this is happening on the week before Tisha B'Av, because look what you did to us on the, the day after Tisha B'Av in terms of Gaza. And, and again, I think their argument is profound. Right, there's a lot of that out there, there's a which lot. is kind of scary, right? Everybody has baggage, and they're making, letting their baggage might be valuable and viable, but it is driving the way they act now. And from that, it's needless in terms of the conversation. I mean, it's even fascinating to think that the, the connection they make between judicial reform and coming out of Gaza is when Sharon decided to pull out of Gaza, the um, people petitioned the court to to override it, and the court did not. So ironically, what they're saying is because you didn't override that decision, we're taking up away from you the power to override. Uh, right, yeah, it's, right. There's, there's, there's a lot of the history. I mean, the point you're making is an important point, and it's a point that relates to 2,000 years ago, the destruction of the temple, and that is that the history is, is relevant. What happened before is important now. Absolutely. And and if it shouldn't be important because of uh, intellectual reasons, it's important because we're making it important. Um, and, and I think that is one of the challenges that we have with memory. We Jews are known for memory, um, but we can be um, prisoners of our memory as well uh, as inspired uh, by our memory. So so the, the rest of the story uh, deals with Yochanan Ben Zakkai. So Yochanan Ben Zakkai, and there are at least four versions of this story, um, but either he goes to his nephew, who is one of um, the zealots. Um, and again, it, 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 uh, I'm, I'm talking about all of the players and characters here. It's talking about families that are divided, that one uh, believes in one solution and the other believes in another. And so um, he goes um, to um, one of his, uh, his, his sister's son, who is one of the zealots, and he goes, uh, this is is crazy. Um, and um, at this point, uh, unlike what happened in uh, the vote this week, uh, this person says, it is crazy. I don't know how this has happened this way. And he says, well, how do we end it? And Yochanan says, I've got to get out of Jerusalem. Um, and in different various uh, versions, either Caesar had already uh, Vespasian or Titus, there are different opinions who it was, had already heard that Yochanan ben Zakkai uh, was uh, somebody who was um, uh, leaned towards um, uh, uh, the, the Roman rule. Uh, but whatever, they uh, come up with this scheme of putting Yochanan ben Zakkai first in a deathbed and having everybody coming to visit him, and then saying that he died, and then putting him into a coffin, and then uh, taking him out uh, of the city. And, uh, you know, there were all twists and turns in the drama that are, uh, are in all of the versions. The uh, zealots want to make sure they're not being cheated. They want to poke it. They want to move it. Uh, the, the rabbis say, how can you touch our, our tzaddik, the great righteous Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai? Um, he gets smuggled out of the city, and he goes to either Vespasian or to Titus. Um, either he's recognized or the guy says, what are you doing here? Who are you? He calls um, the general uh, Caesar, um, the the uh, general says, I'm not Caesar. He said, you will be Caesar. Turns out Caesar dies. He gets the tweet. Um, he says, you know, you, you're right. You showed me something I didn't know. What wish can I give you? And at this point, um, uh, Yochanan uh, ben Zakkai uh, says the famous words, Tainli 
Yavna v'chachameha. Give me um, uh, Yavna uh, and its uh, scholars. And um, the fascinating thing about this is you could read this as Yochanan ben Zakkai was a traitor very easily. Uh, You mentioned Josephus a second ago. Josephus was a a Jewish general um, who uh, went to the other side uh, and became, uh, without without him, uh, without that Benedict Arnold, we would not know a lot of our history. He became uh, the historian. historian. But besides writing a great history, uh, he goes down in Jewish history, I think, as a traitor. And there are scholarly articles quoted on the source sheet that basically ask why was Yochanan ben Zakkai not considered a traitor? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. It's hard to know what he wanted. What do you think he wanted with Ten Liyavne V'chachameha? So, going back to the movie, <laughs> in the screenshots from the movie that I show, um, he, uh, and I think the movie is pretty uh, traditional in this regard, and um, it says, uh, "Give me ten li vitalmi die et ha'ir yavna," and then it goes on to say, "Kedei uh, shenatzil et Torah ha'yehudim," in order to save the Torah of the Jews. So I think the traditional explanation has always been that this was a spiritual move. This was a religious move that he had given up on physically saving Jerusalem. And what he was seeing was, and I think it's so symbolic that he was carried out in a coffin and almost like somebody who started another religion, he comes out of the coffin and lo and behold, Judaism, rabbinic Judaism is is reborn. On another famous occasion, he's with his two friends and they start crying when they see the destroyed temple. And they said, he says, why are you not crying? And they say, well, we're crying because we can't bring sacrifices anymore. He says, you can't bring sacrifices, but you can do good deeds. Meaning to say that rabbinic Judaism replaced what what the temple was, and in so far it was a rebirth. But I think that's pretty much the traditional explanation. Would you agree? That is absolutely the traditional explanation. And the traditional explanation is very positive towards Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. That's important to say, that he did the right thing. He recognized the situation and he did the right thing. So in Gitin uh, 56b, um, it uh, says that um, uh, it, it gives a version of the story, and um, it says um, the king asks him, "What does he want?" Um, and and the king, of course, says, "Why didn't you come till now?" And he says, "The zealots didn't let me come." Um, and then um, he's asked, "What do you want?" And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was silent and did not answer. In light of this, Rav Yosef later read the following verse about him, and some say that it was Rabbi Akiva, who applied the verse to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, I am the Lord who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolish. That's from Isaiah. As Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai should have said the following to Vespasian, in response, in such a case we take tongs, remove the snake, and kill it, and this way we leave the barrel intact so too you should kill the rebels and leave the city as it is. So you would expect Rabbi Akiva to say, he should have asked for Jerusalem. Rabbi Akiva doesn't say, ask for Jerusalem. He, he uses a metaphor that Vespasian used, and he says, listen, we have been hijacked by these zealots. Why don't you, Vespasian, go in and kill the zealots? So he would have Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai ask, Ask the uh, Vespasian to kill Jews, to kill the zealots. Fascinating, isn't it? That is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's so complicated here to understand which side of the Jews everybody is on, right? That's really, I mean, this last thing that you said, right? The zealots, the, you know, who, who's, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys within the Jewish community? Yeah. And, and it doesn't stop there. Um, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said to him, Give me Yavna and its sages and do not destroy it. Spare the dynasty of Rabbi Gamliel. Do not kill them. And lastly, give me doctors to heal Rabbi Tzadok. 
Rav Yosef read the following verse about him, and some say it was Rabbi Akiva who applied the verse, I am the Lord who turns wise men backwards and makes their knowledge foolish. And according to this, he says, he should have said to them, leave the Jews alone this time. Give them a break. Turn another eye. So again, we do have the zealots. We do have uh, the Yochanan ben Zakkai's. And we do have the Akibas who see things slightly differently. I'll just say, I mean, just what an interesting, just to make sure I get it in before we finish. We started at the beginning by saying that the situation in Israel, it's interesting what's going to happen afterwards, after the vote. And it's interesting to just to, to mention for a minute that after the destruction of the temple, the zealots, the, you know, the, the zealots, the Sadducees, the, the priests, the upper class lost all their status because once they lost Jerusalem, the upper class had no status at all. And it was only the Pharisees. It was only the rabbis who had the status. So it's so interesting to see both before for the event and after the event, how things turned around. Yeah. But here's where I come up with something that I discovered that I think is a change maker. It's a change maker for me, especially in how I look at Tishabov. I started by saying that there are many Jews, secular Jews, that are celebrating or commemorating Tisha B'Av this year uh, for the first time because we are in this 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 um, uh, just terrible uh, situation. But I want to read from David Ben Gurion, and it actually is a commentary of David Ben Gurion on the Talmudic texts that we have read. It's in an article that discusses Ben Gurion's concept of Mamlachtiyut, which literally means statehood. And um, you will recall that in the President Herzog's speech uh, to Congress, he said that democracy is in the DNA of the Jewish people. And I was talking to a common friend in Israel, and he said, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And I started thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I said, you know, he's absolutely right. It's not in our DNA. You want to talk about our DNA? I open up a synagogue. Two weeks later, we have an argument. You open up another synagogue synagogue. We do not know how to get along. Our reflex is sectarianism. Our reflex is um, to need some outsider to keep control of us. We've been out of the land longer than we've been in it. So now, listen to Ben-Gurion, because what I think, Rabbi, and this might be a shocker to you, and it is Madlik, but I think for 2,000 years, we've been commemorating Sinat Chinam. We've been talking about all of these terrible things that have happened, the people that really follow Tisha B'Av, they didn't start a state. Um, the, the people that today are making these problems, they're writing this in to the tapestry of Tisha B'Av. That's not our way out of it. So listen to Ben-Gurion as he describes something that is absolutely new to the DNA of the Jews, Mamlach statehood, and what we need to get to it. So first of all, and I'm just going to read the whole thing. It's Tisha B'Av. Where else do we have to go? Here we go. Take it away. In a letter to one of the founding fathers of the Zionist agricultural settlements in Palestine, Menachem Yusishkin, written in 1936, Ben-Gurion quoted a British friend who maintained that the Jewish people had shown prophetic capabilities but lacked those needed to maintain a state. Ben-Gurion painfully accepted this critical historical comment and then moved on to discuss the historic failure of ancient Judea to preserve its independence. He ascribed this turn of events to a lack of unity, to the failure to identify the approaching signs of danger, and to effectively organize to face them. Finally, and most critically, he pointed to the absence of political skill and statesmanship that could have prevented the catastrophe, the destruction of the Second Temple, and the independent Jewish state. Ben-Gurion writes in this letter. Now we're listening to David Ben-Gurion, our first Prime Minister. During the time of the First Temple, we did not conquer the entire country, and we maintained our independence for only a few years because we were always divided and quarreling among ourselves. 
And the nations around us ate us with every mouth. First Israel fell and then came under turn. He goes on, internal strife broke out immediately and the weaker party invited Rome, which had tended to our aid, took over the country and destroyed us all. When the sword of destruction hung over Jerusalem, the zealots slaughtered one another and Jerusalem turned into shambles. The legions of Rome would not have destroyed the country if the Jews had not prepared the ground for it. At the time of the gravest danger in our history, before the destruction of the Second Temple, the Jews did not know how to unite, did not identify the external dangers, and did not find in themselves the political talent to prevent the catastrophe, which would have been averted if such a talent had been found in the Jewish people at that time. Even the few sages who could see into the future, or the one and very special among them, understood the importance of saving Yavna and its sages. Yavna and its sages are important, but they do not constitute a Jewish state. And and did we come over here, the people of Bilu, the members of the second Aliyah, and the new Aliyah, to build in this country Yavna and its sages, and under the auspices of the Mufti? No. We want to build a state, and we shall not be able to do so without political thought, political talent, and political prudence. High-flown phrases, vision, and emotion alone are not sufficient to build a state. They may be sufficient for Netzach Yisrael, that's the spiritual aspect of Judaism, or existence in the diaspora, for maintaining a yeshiva, a university, and a rabbinic court, but not for the construction of a state. No external danger, even the worst one, has frightened me, but I am horrified by the internal danger, the danger of political blindness, the lightheartedness with which we relate to dangers that threaten us, the naivete with which we attempt to solve complicated questions, the lack of talent to understand each other and appreciate each other's difficulties, and lack of talent to act as one entity in which a single member bends his will to that of the majority. We have always behaved this way in difficult crisis in our history. We did not disappear from the face of the earth as other nations did, but we failed to remain independent in our homeland. We failed to save our state. This time, our task is not to maintain a state, but to build it. This constitutes a much more difficult political skill, and I do not see that we know it. So what he's saying is we are great at preserving ourselves, but that is not the talent that we need right now. We need. That's an amazing speech. He goes on. He goes on. He goes. Rabbi Ben Zakan personified in Ben Gurion's eyes the exclusive commitment to the spiritual element in Judaism. Bar Kochma personified the commitment to independence, even against impossible odds. But it was Rabbi Akiva, the effort to reconcile between the two commitments. Rabbi Akiva actively supported. So this this deserves more study because it's not simply Bar Kochma making a general statement. He's literally talking about our pieces of Talmud. And the only thing besides Rabbi Rabbi Akiva's comments that we already saw, which kind of, you know, they touched upon what he, how he criticized Yochanan ben Zakkai. There's another comment, a famous comment that's part of every, uh, uh, in Israel, they use it all the time. It's Tefasta Miruba Lo Tefasta. That is attributed to Rabbi Akiva. If you right. ask for too much, you get nothing. nothing. And I think um, it's part of Ben-Gurion, what he excelled at was making the hard compromises. But what he points at is, we just don't have it in our DNA. And sometimes the beginning of knowledge is to know that you don't have something, that you are ignorant. And I think for us to look back at our classical sources for guidance here is, I'm sorry to say, Rabbi, it's it's, it's, it's 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 a wrong direction. We need it's, a mis- it's misleading. It's misleading. It was right then, but it's not right now. It's a, I think you agree with me. What Ben-Gurion wrote is just unbelievable. 
that speech was worth Tisha B'Av. I want to wish everybody on that note, that's a good note to, you know, to go into the rest of Tisha B'Av. Everybody should have an easy rest of the fast. And um, um, Jeffrey, you should post that speech because everybody on Tisha B'Av should read that speech. Amazing. Take care. Easy fast and look forward to seeing everybody from Jerusalem next week. Be well. Thank you. And as I said before, we can mourn and we can learn, but there has to be a way out of this. Um, and uh, I think we need to look to ourselves for that, and to the, for that we need to come together. So um, uh, uh, Tisha B'Av is here. Uh, tomorrow's Amen. a new day. Um, and uh, I wish you all well, and I'll see you all next week.